Hello everyone, it's Seth, probably better known as Saffron Olive, and it's time for another daily dose of alchemy spoilers. And today, we got a bunch of crazy new digital-only cards to talk about for the new alchemy format standard, plus these new cards, plus rebalances, and for the historic format. So we should probably jump right into it, start talking about these ridiculous new cards. Before we do, a couple of quick reminders. One, if you want to keep up on all the latest spoilers, you should head over to mtgpreviews.com. We update them throughout the day. They're sortable, filterable, all that good stuff. Number two, a shout out to our awesome sponsor, Card Kingdom. If you need some magic cards, you can get them by heading over to cardkingdom.com slash mtgoldfish. Even get a free goldfish sticker. Let them know you want one in your order notes and they'll hook you up. So anyway, let's talk alchemy. So first up today, we got a bunch of white cards from Alchemy. And as a refresher, these are legal in Alchemy, which is standard, plus these cards, plus rebalancings. Also in Historic, they do not exist in paper. But our first card is actually really powerful. Divine Purge. Three mana sorcery. Exile all artifacts and creatures with mana value three or less. They perpetually gain. This spell costs two more to cast in this permanent enters the battlefield tapped for as long as each of them remains exiled its owners may play it so essentially this is a, a ritual of so a three mana white ritual of so mixed with a little bit of a mini creeping corrosion that isn't a permanent answer though it's essentially elite spellbinder you are exiling everything temporarily uh, but players can recast their stuff with a two mana elite spellbinder style tax and i actually think this card is borderline insane like i think this has staple potential in elk me and also in historic because when you really think about it sure it's not a hard wrath sure you're going to sweep away the board and your opponent's going to be able to replay stuff but this is really fast at three mana and in the early game hitting two three four cheap creatures it's going to be really hard for an aggro deck to rebuild from that so a uh, picture in alchemy which essentially is standard but picture in alchemy against like mono white you literally hit every single creature in their deck against mono green you pretty much hit every creature in their deck so this is going to come down and it's just really going to slow the those decks down sure it's not a permanent answer but this is probably gonna buy you three turns or something like a decent amount of time to find your big finisher to find more hard removal whatever and then be able to proceed to win the game also really good against tokens tokens if they get exiled they just cease to exist so there's no recasting the wolf token from ranger class or recasting the huge tree folks from ren in seven so it goes even further up in value there if you're snagging some tokens so i think this is in the conversation alongside doom scar in various controlled alongside blunt in the snow and like orzov control if not in the main deck then at least in the sideboard where this is super super fast like playing this on turn three against mono white against mono green against mono red is going to be a huge swing in your favor uh, it's going to take your opponent a while to recast their stuff especially with that tax and by that time you're probably playing your finishers your planeswalkers or whatever you're trying to do so really really good in alchemy in historic i think it's also really good it hits everything against the Luris deck it hits essentially everything against collected company decks and those are a lot of the big decks in the historic format are built around these type of effects. Imagine against like historic humans. You're just wiping them out. You get pretty much everything against the sack decks. It's great against the burning Tramis series style decks, elves, goblins. So I think this card has staple level potential. Sure, it's weird. It's different. It's, uh, you know, not a full on wrath because the cards can be recast, but it's cheap enough that I think this offers a lot of value. And I would not be the least bit surprised to see this be a sideboard staple in both historic and elf me and who knows in the right meta this could even have some main deck potential and then the artifact thing we haven't talked about it much i'm sure there will be times when that'll be really relevant but there's just not really a artifact deck right now that's at the top of the format in historic in uh alchemy and if there is an artifact deck it's kind of like a you know an affinity style deck where most of the artifacts are creatures anyway so i view that mostly as a bonus but even as just this weird cheap temporary creature wrath i think divine purge is a really strong magic card Next up, we got a new human, Expedition Supplier. So Expedition Supplier, three mana, two, two human warrior. When it enters the battlefield or another human enters the battlefield under your control, you get to conjure a utility knife onto the battlefield, only do it once each turn. So conjure... 
Uh, you create out of thin air, essentially. So you're just making a utility knife. If you're not familiar with the utility knife, it's not a super powerful equipment. One mana to cast, three to equip. When it enters the battlefield, you get to attach it to target creature you control. You give the equipped creature plus one, plus one. The big deal here is that free equipping. So essentially what this means is all by itself, you play Expedition Supplier, you counter the utility knife, you put the utility knife on the Expedition Supplier, and suddenly you get a three, three for three. That's not crazy, but then you got the upside that if you play a human the next turn, you get another one in another one which i actually think in a really weird roundabout way compares expedition supplier to a luminarch aspirant type effect if you think about luminarch aspirant it essentially puts a plus one plus one counter on a creature every turn well if you're playing a decent amount of humans in your deck and can play one every turn once expedition supplier is out you're kind of doing the same thing you're getting a utility knife which gives the creature plus one plus one and you get to equip it for free each and every turn uh, the upside is uh, you actually have a utility knife while three to equip is a lot it is definitely possible that the game goes long, the creature that you free equip dies, and then you end up moving the utility knives around to other creatures. So I actually think this card, even though it's different and strange, I actually think it could be pretty powerful in some sort of human shell. So in alchemy, probably like mono white humans, green white humans, I think this is good enough to be in the conversation. Although at the same time, something we've talked about before, humans have a ridiculous number of powerful three drops. So you got elite spellbinders, you got eight elites, you have uh, stuff like Brutal Cathar. You got Skyclave Apparition. There's a ton of competition for those slots. So even though Expedition Supplier, I think, is strong, it's possible that it doesn't really make it in high numbers just because there's so many other good three drops. I think the same is true in Historic. In Historic, you got the shells for it. It can be, you know, an additional Luminarch Aspirant in the human aggro decks. It works with Collected Company. But then you got the same concern as well. There's just a lot of strong human three drops. So is grabbing a utility knife going to be enough? We'll have to wait and see. I think there's also some more janky potential because remember getting a utility knife if you can do it every single turn is also adding an artifact to the battlefield so maybe you can build a deck where you're using the utility knives not so much as equipment but just as artifacts to power up other things like shambling suit cares about the number of artifacts or enchantments you have on the battlefield so every utility knife is going to grow its power and you still get the utility knife or tezzeret master of the bridge with its affinity for artifacts ability and draining equal to artifacts the challenge is going to be having enough humans to consistently trigger your expedition supplier in a deck that's also playing like shambling shoots or tesserets but i can see that being a possibility the other way to go with this is just to embrace the equipment aspect we got creatures in historic and in standard that just want to be equipped like core blade master giving stuff double strike or helvar giving stuff double strike Kroll protecting stuff a carry drawing cards blainer getting super massive so maybe there's some sort of equipment style deck although it is awkward the expedition supplier even though it's a human warrior it cares about humans rather than warriors in both historic and in alchemy the main like equipment tribe is warriors so if you're playing your curies and your blade masters and your blainers and your crolls and your hellvars for that matter they're not actually triggering your expedition supplier so again you got this weird mixture problem where you're gonna have to have enough humans to trigger expedition supplier every turn but you're also playing mostly a warrior deck let's say so that's gonna be the challenge so is this good enough just to stick in human tribal I think the answer is maybe. Like, I do think this is a more powerful card than probably a lot of people realize. I actually think the comparison to Luminarch's Pirate is kind of fair, even though it's one more mana, so that is the drawback. But what it does on the battlefield is actually very Luminarch Aspirant esque. On the other hand, oh, there's a lot of good human three drops, so it might not make the cut, even though it is a strong card. Next up, we got our first alchemy uncommon in Angel of Unity. So, Angel of Unity, two mana, one, three, Angel Cleric with flying and lifelink when it enters the battlefield or when you cast a party spell a cleric rogue warrior wizard choose a party creature so a cleric rogue warrior wizard in your hand it perpetually gets plus one plus one so angel unity I actually really like this card. Party has mostly been a flop. We've seen some really fringe decks in standard or historic take advantage of the mechanic, but it is definitely the definition of like tier three. It is not really super competitive at all. And it's kind of an interesting mechanic. And I like that it's getting more support. I think Angel of Unity is certainly good in a 
party deck. Like, yeah, it's not super pushed or overpowered, but it is good enough that you would play it. And I think that party getting a little bit better is a good thing. So essentially, you want to get this down early. You want to play party spells, I guess, those creature types, and then hopefully hold on to a party creature to in hand to grow them. I think if you're playing a party deck in standard, build around uh, Lynn Valler, Nimble Tramp Fighter, or Squad Commander, or an Historic where we have some like collected company party decks, I think the Angel of Unity is at the very least worth testing. And I expect that it's actually pretty good in the deck. Uh, I mean, a 1 3 Flying Lifelink, a good blocker against aggro in the early game. Plus, it's kind of a party lord in a weird way, as long as you can keep a creature in your hand to get that perpetual plus one plus one. So, Angel of Unity is kind of exactly what I like to see out of these alchemy cards. Cards designed to power up mechanics, tribes, themes that are cool, but just not quite there competitively. I don't think Angel Unity takes party from tier three to tier one. I don't even know if it takes it from tier three to tier two, but I do think the party gets a little bit better with Angel of Unity existing. Next up, oh, I love this card. We have Slayer's Bounty, one of my favorite cards that we've seen from Alchemy so far. So one mana legendary artifact clue. When it enters the battlefield, look at the creature cards in target's opponent's hand. So you get a, a little peek, not at everything, just at the creatures they have in hand. And that's the part that makes it unplayable in paper, obviously, or you couldn't print this as a real non-digital card because how would you know what cards are creatures? You have to trust your opponent to only reveal the creatures. That would be really wonky, uh, but it works fine on Arena. And then when you sacrifice Slayer's Bounty or another clue, you draft a card from its spell book and you can pay two to sacrifice it just like a clue. So essentially what this is, is a card that doubles up your clues. If you sack a clue, you draw a card, and then you also get to draft one of the spells from Slayer's Bounty Spellbook. If you look at the spellbook, it's just a bunch of removal spells, really. There's one oddball in Raise the Alarm, which makes two 1-1 one, one soldiers. Otherwise, it is just a huge suite of removal spells. None of them, like, super high-end pushed rare removal spells. But still, they're removal spells. They're going to deal with something. What this essentially means is every time you crack a clue, you're going to get your card, and you're going to get a removal spell as a kicker. How this works is they pop up three options from this list. You choose one of them. So you might not always get the right removal spell, but you are always going to get a removal spell. And I think that's actually a super powerful effect. Like your clue sacking to draw two cards instead of one and knowing that one of those cards is going to be some kind of removal spell. That seems like something that is worth building around if you can support it. The only problem I see for Slayer's Bounty is we don't have a lot of clue support in standard or in historic, really. Like in standard, there's... Briar Bridge Tracker, uh, I guess it works with the Denix system or Investigator's Journey, but it's not like we have a ton of clues running around. So I don't know if you can build like a full on clue tribal deck, but maybe some sort of like, I don't know, Bant Graveyard Disturb deck with the clue stuff thrown in could work. Like being able to sack your Briar Bridge Tracker clue and get a random removal spell along with getting your card, that's a powerful effect. Once you get back to Historic, it gets a bit better. Like Thraven Inspector is a good option, Hard Evidence, Wave Sifter, Long honest can make a ton of clues so there's a little more support there but honestly at this point neither alchemy nor historic has a ton of clue support so i don't think you can build full-on clue tribal so this might in some ways be a wait and see card like once we get more clue production uh, the slayer's bounty is going to go up even more in value in a format like historic like this is a worthy payoff for paying a bunch of clues sure it's legendary but that doesn't matter because you can sack it anyway if you draw multiples the other thing to mention about this card is I don't even think it's that bad on its own. I wouldn't say it's exciting on its own, but think about what this does all by itself. Let's say you're playing some sort of mono white deck that doesn't have a lot of card advantage. You play Sayer's Bounty for one mana. You get a peek at your opponent's hand, and then you sack it for two mana. So you're playing three total mana. You're getting a random card from your deck, the top card of your deck, and you're also getting one of the cards from its spell book, one of those removal spells. So essentially, that's a, a white divination. That's also a one mana artifact. If those synergies matter, it's a clue. If those energies matter so even as a standalone card with no other clue production in your deck I almost think this could be in the conversation, especially if you have artifact synergies. If you can loop this with an Emery, let's say, or you have a all that glitters, which is growing your creatures, like anything like that, this is going to go up even further in value. So Slayer's Bounty, 
I actually think this card is really powerful. Having all of your clues sacked for two cards rather than one on a one mana artifact that is also a clue that you can sack if you need to or if you draw multiples because it's legendary, that's actually like kind of an insane effect. The only thing that's holding it back right now is a lack of other good clue cards, but I would not be at all surprised if eventually this was a very playable card and I think it could see some play right now. Next up, we have a spicy two drop in Sigarden Evangel. So Sigarden Evangel, two mana, three one. So pretty aggressive stats to start off with. Human Cleric, when it enters a battlefield, you conjure a card named Sigarden Evangel into your hand. So you create one out of thin air, put it into your hand, and then at the beginning of the next end step, you have to discard it. So use it or lose it, essentially. And then when it enters a battlefield, you can tap target permanent you don't control. So maybe get a blocker out of the way so you can keep attacking with your other stuff. So this card is really interesting to me. At first glance, it looks like a, a bad squadron hawk. It's ground bound, although it does get a lot more power, which is nice. A 3 1 for 2 isn't horrible stats in an aggro deck. And then when you cast it, you get another copy of it. The twist is you got to play it this turn or else it ends up in the graveyard. But when you really think about how this is going to work, that might not be a bad thing. So, like on level one, you wait till you get up to four mana and you cast a cigar in Evangel and you get another one. You cast a cigar in Evangel and you get another one. If you get up to 20 mana, you just keep chaining these together. You cast one, cast another, cast another, cast another, cast another. They just keep conjuring each other. So you have this like weird, almost pseudo infinite combo potential. Like if you make infinite mana, you could cast infinite number of these with a single card. So that part is definitely interesting. And I think in some decks, even just running it out on turn two and putting the other copy into your graveyard, discarding on your end step is going to be good. So one home for this human style aggro decks. As I mentioned before, a three, one, four, two, fine aggro stats. If you're playing an aggro tribe like humans, the tap a permanent when it comes into play, that's actually a nice ability. You get a black out of the way so you can get through more damage. So I could see alchemy or historic humans possibly trying this card. It's a two drop that on turn two, it's fine. You just run it out, tap something down, get a reasonable body, get another copy in your graveyard. And then on turn four or turn six or turn eight, it gets even better. You'd run off the top of your deck when you're empty handed and you just cast as many of these as you can and flood the board. So it's kind of this two drop that is fine on turn two, but insane in the late game once you run out of cards because it's so much inherent card advantage. Maybe even a better home in alchemy might be clerics. In clerics, you get this graveyard recursion theme. You got stuff like Ori. You got stuff like Aghanim's Awakening. You're sacking stuff to Pyre of Heroes. And this is the kind of tribe that can take advantage of running out of Cigar and Evangel on turn two. You run it out on turn two. Later in the game, you get back the conjured copy that you discarded with an Aghanim's Awakening. And that's going to make another copy because it triggers whenever it enters the battlefield, even if you didn't cast it. And then maybe you get that one back or you sack it to a Pyre of Heroes and get something else. So I feel like there's a lot of synergy there. The other place this is kind of insane, once you go back to Historic, is how about Lurus decks? Think about a Lurus deck. You cast this on turn two, you conjure the copy, discard the copy. Later in the game, you get your Lurus, you can cast the copy from the graveyard, that's gonna conjure another copy that you can discard at the end of your turn, which then you can cast with your Lurus, and then you can do that again and again and again. So every turn, you're essentially gonna have a Sigarden Evangel in your graveyard that you can cast with Lurus, and it gets even crazier with other synergies, like Return to the Ranks. Let's imagine getting several of these in the graveyard with the conjure mechanic, return to the ranks and back. They're each going to trigger to make another copy that you get in your graveyard. So your next copy of return to the ranks is going to make even more of them. And all of a sudden you just have like 50 cigar and evangels on the battlefield also works with blink shenanigans. You can ephemerate this to get a copy and put it in your hand, maybe cast it. If you don't cast it, get it in the graveyard, get it back later or soul herder to conjure a copy every single turn. So there's a lot of shenanigans here. When you first read this card, you're like, eh, okay, whatever. It's kind of like a, a weird squadron hog, but because of how conjure works, I actually think this is a really powerful card that has potential in alchemy and also in historic. Just the fact that if you get to four mana, you get two of these with one card. If you get to six mana, you get three of them with one card. Plus those graveyard shenanigans actually makes me pretty high on this card, even though it might not look like that much at first glance. Next up, can I get a call call for Suntail Squadron? Four mana instant, conjure a card named Suntail Hawk into your hand. Then if you have fewer than seven cards in hand, repeat this process. So this is potentially four mana instant speed, draw seven in white, the best white card draw spell ever printed. The problem is, huh, every card you draw, is a Suntail Hawk, a 1-1 one, one flying bird for one. Is this card good? 
I actually really am not sure. Like, on one hand, it's an absurd amount of card advantage. Uh, if you are empty-handed or close to empty-handed, let's say you're playing an aggro deck, and you empty your hand, you top deck this, you play this, you're going to refill your hand with a single card, which is really rare in a white deck. That's not something white decks can normally do. At the same time, uh, the cards that you're drawing are not especially powerful, and you still have to spend the mana to cast them. Like, let's say you do draw seven Sundale Hawks. Well, then you're going to have to spend seven mana one by one to get them on the battlefield, and then you just got a bunch of 1-1 one -one flyers, which isn't bad i mean but compared to lingering souls lingering souls you play it you flash it back it's five mana of four one one flyers or spectral procession you cast it for three mana you get three one one flyers like a one one flyer is probably not worth a mana like maybe it's worth a mana it's right on the borderline of being worth the mana uh it's gonna cost you a lot of mana you're paying a four mana tax to cast suntail squadron to get that card advantage and then you still got to cast them so you're paying what 1.5 mana per suntail hawk or something which is kind of a lot at the same time like you're a white deck if you're playing something like mono white aggro you can't really be picky about your sources of card advantage this is an overflowing insight potentially if you're out of cards in hand uh, on the other hand if you have a bunch of cards in hand it's much less interesting if you got four cards in hand casting this to get three suntail hawks in hand and then casting them you're spending a total of seven mana to draw three suntail hawks and get them on the battlefield that's not very exciting when a you know a spectral procession for three mana is just going to put three suntail hawks essentially the same power and toughness and same abilities as a suntail hawk on the battlefield so i don't know maybe there's some sort of flying tribal deck that would want this like blue white flyers with favorable wins or curious obsession flyers lofty denial flyers there are some payoffs in historic for just playing flying stuff so the design is neat it's cool it is a lot of card advantage in white but the card isn't especially efficient so we'll have to wait and see my guess is this is more of a weird janky fun against the odd style card than an actual competitive card but anytime you see a white card that can potentially refill your hand you gotta take notice because that's just not something white can usually do now Next up, we have a pretty crazy white mythic and ethereal escort. So a three mana three three spear. It has lifelink, and when it enters the battlefield or attacks, you choose a card in your hand, and it perpetually so for the rest of the game gains lifelink so at a glance this kind of looks like splendor mare almost card that definitely didn't break anything i mean a three mana three through lifelink isn't bad but ethereal escort has some really big upsides for one thing it's repeatable when it enters the battlefield or attacks you give a card in your hand lifelink so you could be giving multiple things in your hand lifelink which is obviously beneficial either winning the race in an aggro mirror or if you're in some sort of life gain deck by far the most interesting part of this card though is if you read its ability it doesn't say give a creature in your hand lifelink it says give a card in your hand lifelink which opens up a bunch of shenanigans that we've just never seen before in magic so as far as where you can play this card you could just play it as kind of an aggro mirror breaker and some sort of white weenie deck like if you're a luminarch aspirants and your threats have lifelink and your opponents don't you're probably gonna win the race also seems pretty good in life gain decks like voice of the blessed for example the more things they gain lifelink the more life you gain the more counters you get on your voice of the blessed so that's a possibility maybe spirits in alchemy or in historic uh, it is a spirit although i don't know if spirits really care about this maybe it could be a sideboard card in spirits uh, where spirits really want to be kind of tempo-y and aggressive and close out the game i don't know if they care about this incidental life game but really what i imagine with ethereal escort is kind of this weird combo piece almost like you can play it fairly but it also seems great for like the ill-tempered loner infinite life combo we played in standard for much of a little while ago where the idea is you give ill-tempered loner lifelink and indestructible and then you damage it and it keeps damaging itself and you gain infinite life well ethereal escort is perfect with this you play the turn before ill-tempered loner you give the loner lifelink and then all you gotta do is give it indestructible with something later in the game plus you're doing this with a good card one of the issues with some of these combos is you play janky cards to get the lifelink or whatever well ethereal escort it's a reasonable card a three mana three three lifelink is not a bad card so great for this combo but the most interesting part of ethereal escort by far is the fact that you can give any card card lifelink so you can give a royal eruption lifelink and throw it at your opponent's face and turn it into a lightning helix which is kind of sweet you can give a planeswalker like chandra dress to kill lifelink so when you ping your opponent you're going to be gaining life you can give roiling vortex lifelink so as you're dealing damage you're actually gaining a bunch of life which is actually kind of hilarious imagine giving like star of extinction lifelink and casting it and blowing up a bunch of stuff with 20 damage to each you're probably going to gain like hundreds of life so ethereal escort why well, i certainly think it's possible this is just played fairly to 
to swing the race in an aggro mirror. I think it's most interesting when you're giving these non-creature spells lifelink, stuff that we've never been able to really give lifelink before, not very easily at least, and pulling off combos where you gain hundreds of life with Star of Extinction, going infinite with Ill-Tempered Loner, doing crazy Planeswalker shenanigans. So I really like this card. It's something we've never seen before, the ability to give any card in our hand lifelink for the rest of the game. Plus, it comes attached to a pretty reasonable body. We also got another draft card in Faithful Disciple. So a two mana two two human cleric with vigilance. When it dies, draft a card from its spell book. So uh, this is another draw a card to drop. Essentially a, a feral prowler with a twist. A feral prowler, just a random cat that when it dies, you draw a card. Well, Faithful Disciple, when it dies, you draw a card, except you're drawing a card from its spell book to draft mechanic again if you missed it yesterday. Essentially, there's 15 cards in its spell book. You're gonna see three of them at random. You choose the one that you want. And I gotta say, the spell book for Faithful Disciple in specific actually has some pretty good cards. They are all enchantments. Uh, you have stuff like Sigil of the Empty Thrones. It's an enchantment payoff. You got a bunch of creature pumping, uh, Cathars Crusade, Glorious Anthems, ways to give double strike, other like single creature pumps, all the glitters, gauntlets of light. You got some reanimation and cleric clash. You got some removal and banishing light. So a lot of these cards are powerful. One of the things we've talked about with some of these draft from a spellbook cards is the spellbook cards just aren't all that good. Uh, the difference here is you really only get to use Faithful Disciple once. Some of the other draft from a spellbook cards are repeatable, like pay two mana, exile some cards, and do this, or sack a clue and do this. So you obviously got to power those down if you're going to be doing it again and again and again. Faithful Disciple, unless you're reanimating it or something, it's just going to be one shot. One time you're going to get it. Uh, so you can have some more powerful cards, although there's still a concern here. Like, let's say you just jam this in something like white weenie uh, and you have it die and you get to draft a card what happens if you are staring back at sigil the empty throne anointed procession divine visitation you kind of get nothing like technically you're getting a card in your hand but you're getting something that cares about enchantment something that cares about tokens if you're not playing one of those uh, one of those archetypes and the card really doesn't do anything so there's going to be occasions when this kind of whiffs or there's going to be times when you don't really have any good creatures on board and you get all that glitters angelic gift and gauntlets of light and you're like well what am i going to do with this on the other hand there are some just generically good cards. If you're playing White Weenie and you hit a Cathars Crusade or a Glorious Anthem, you're going to be super happy with that being the card that you drew. So how this compares to just a Feral Prowler, just die, draw a card, it's really hard to say because of the randomness of this mechanic. Like, you're never going to hit a land. You're always going to get a non-land, but you might get a non-land that's not that good for your deck. Although, since you get to see three options, that does shift the math in your favor. Like, getting the Nightmare Pile of being White Weenie and getting Sigil, Anointed Procession, Divine Visitation, like three literal dead cards, uh, that is pretty unlikely. So hopefully you'll get at least one good option out of the pile. So we'll have to wait and see. I could imagine this showing up in some sort of just white aggro deck. Maybe it could show up in an enchantment deck. It's a little weird that it itself is not an enchantment, even though it's going to seek out an enchantment, but it could work with like Catildas and Hallowed Haunting, some sort of Enchantress style deck. So I don't know, definitely an interesting card, but this new mechanic, it's actually really hard to evaluate. Just how strong is this compared to just drawing a random card from your deck. Like, Faithful Disciple, if it was a 2-mana two 2-2, two, two, a human cleric with the same abilities that just drew a card when it died, it wouldn't be that exciting. Like, compared to the other stuff that sees competitive play in Standard slash Alchemy or in Historic, I don't think that would be a super playable card, but maybe this draft from a spellbook mechanic ups its power a little bit and makes it worth it. We also got Angel of Eternal Dawn, a pretty interesting new hate angel i guess a three minute two four flyer it says when it enters the battlefield it becomes day it cannot become night and your opponents can't cast spells with mana value greater than the number of turds that they have begun so uh this is a card that hates on a couple of different things uh, it compares kind of to redain that's what it reminded me of the most just this three mana flyer that kind of taxes your opponents a bit so how strong is angel of eternal dawn and what does it hate on well first off keeping it from becoming night is pretty narrowly targeted at werewolves and I guess the Celestis. So if you run into werewolves, this card's kind of insane if it sticks out. Tovalar's not going to flip. Celestis isn't going to flip. All other werewolves aren't going to flip. The only downside is werewolves aren't a huge part of the meta. So I guess it's nice that there's this safety valve in case werewolves ever become overpowered. But right now, I don't think I'd play Angel of Eternal Dawn just to hate on werewolves. I don't know. I guess you get a reasonable enough body. But still, I don't think there's enough werewolf decks to warrant playing a hate card either 
in alchemy or in historic. The other ability, though, is kind of interesting. It's going to do a really good job of slowing down ramp style decks in the early game. So if you think about how this plays, let's say you play Angel of Eternal Dawn on turn three. Uh, when your opponent goes to their third turn, they can't cast anything that has mana value for a greater. So if they have a Shambling Gas, they sack for a treasure. If they have a Lotus Cobra making extra mana, it doesn't matter. They can't cast anything with mana value greater than the number of turns they have started. Uh, same with like hating on Elrin's Epiphany. I know it's gonna be a change rebalance, so this doesn't actually apply. It's new text should apply. But I mean, it's a good example still. The four tail cost is six. It's normal mana cost is seven. If your opponent's only begun six turns, they still can't foretell their Elrin's Epiphany because the mana value is 7 so they can't cast a spell. It's going to stop Golos from spinning into an Ulamog or other ramp style decks. The only downside is it is going to kind of wear off as the game goes along. Uh, if Thalia or Redain, their tax is always going to apply. Like, it's always two more mana to cast your expensive spells. You're not one more mana to cast your non-creature spells. Angel of Eternal Dawn, as the game goes by, more turns go by. Your opponent's going to be able to cast more stuff. So once you get to turn 8 or 9 or 10 or whatever, then this is kind of not doing anything. It's just a 2-4 flyer. So I think this is kind of a tempo card, a delay card, where it's not going to lock your opponent out of the game, but it is going to slow down ramp decks. It is going to kind of body werewolf decks for no apparent reason. Uh, but if you can play this, maybe slow your opponent down a little bit, make them play awkwardly, not optimally, and kill them before enough turns go by, I think it can be a pretty powerful card. So definitely a weird one. Turns going by is not something we're used to caring about in Magic, but a pretty interesting effect nonetheless. Less. Next up, we have one of maybe the most powerful cards that we've seen from Alchemy so far, Inquisitor Captain, 4 mana, 3-3 three, three Human Cleric. It is Vigilance. When it enters a battlefield, if there are 20 or more creature cards with mana value 3 or less among the cards in your graveyard hand and library, seek 2 creatures with mana value 3 or less. So you're going to get 2 random creatures with that 3 mana value or less restriction, put one of them on the battlefield, shuffle the other in your library. So Inquisitor Captain, it's essentially Essentially a hill giant collected company is how I think of it. So when you cast this uh, in, in a deck that is similar to a collected company deck, if you're playing a collected company deck, you're easily going to have enough creatures with mana value three or less to make this work. So you cast this, you're going to get a hill giant, a four mana three, three. Then you're also going to get one of two random three mana value or less cards that were seeked from your deck. You get to choose between those two. So you don't have a ton of control, but you do get a little bit of control. So essentially you play this and you're getting a 3-3 three, three for 4, and you're also getting an Adeline, or you're getting an Elite Spellbinder, or you're getting whatever. Pick a card. That seems kind of insane. That is a lot of value in a format like Alchemy, in a format like Historic even. So I think that this card has a lot of potential in any deck that can meet its requirement. Like, in Alchemy, there's no literal collected company. This is as close as it gets. So I think White Aggro decks just naturally meet this restriction. They have like 30 plus creatures of mana value 3 or less. You play this, you get it and you get a Luminarch Spire or Elite Spellbinder. <laughs> Even better in Clerics, perhaps, which also meets the restriction. Plus, Inquisitor Captain is a Cleric, so you can potentially get some shenanigans there, maybe getting it back with Aura or something. Uh, and you get to seek out another creature. It could show up in multicolor decks with Reckless Stormseeker. Like, if you can meet the restriction of this in your Alchemy deck, I think you play it. That's how strong I think this card is. Like, it's putting Collected Company stats onto the battlefield in a format that doesn't have Collected Company. That is insane. I also think this will show up in Collected Company decks as an additional Collected Company in the historic format. Uh, I don't think it's quite as good as Collected Company, probably, but I think it's actually pretty close. So if you're playing uh, like Human Company, maybe just generic, you know, Bant, Militia Bugler, whatever stuff, shenanigans company. If you're playing a Soul Herder style deck with Collected Company, I think Inquisitor Captain is just an auto include in your deck. You play this alongside Collected Company, you fill your deck with all your creatures, you got plenty of removal creatures, so you don't even need any spells and you just go to town with this ridiculous value it's even better with soul herder because remember this is an etb so you can inquisitor captain maybe get a soul herder with a little bit of luck fingers crossed and then soul herder blink your inquisitor captain to trigger again on your end step and seek out something else and just build this huge board that maybe like ephemerate and do it again and do it again and just overwhelm your opponent super quickly the only thing i will say is you don't get nearly as much selection as you do a 
collected company. Collected company, let's say you're playing 30 creatures in your deck, which is a pretty normal collected company number. You're gonna collect a company, you'll probably three you'll probably see three creatures out of your top six cards. So you'll have three options to choose from, and you get to choose two of them. With Inquisitor Captain, you're only gonna see two creatures, and then you only get to choose one of them. Your second collected company creature quote unquote is going to be the inquisitor captain itself but still even though you don't get quite as much selection and sometimes you're going to get two random one drops and not be super excited i still think this card is good to busted like i i think this is the most powerful card that we have seen from alchemy so far i expect this to be an instant staple in historic an instant staple in alchemy it is absolutely insane the closest thing we've seen to collected company in a very long time and collected company it is a really powerful card like a staple of formats going all the way back to modern probably would have been banned in standard had we been banning like we do today that's how good this is and inquisitor captain is almost there we also got some blue cards not a ton of blue cards a couple of blue cards we got geist of regret a five mana four four mythic spirit it has flying when it enters the battlefield you put a random instant and a random sorcery from your library into your graveyard and then when you cast an insert sorcery spell from your graveyard copy that spell you can choose new targets for the copy so guys to regrets it's kind of like a weird random buried alive for an instant or sorcery I, I mean we don't have a spell in magic's history that gets a random instant sorcery in your graveyard it just doesn't exist so i don't know what to compare it to buried alive is the best i could come up with and then you essentially get a, a savine ability but without the restriction of the first one each turn just any instant or sorcery you cast from your graveyard you you get a copy of it so the question for geist of regret is going to be how many ways do we have to cast instants and sorceries from our graveyard in historic or in alchemy and the answer is only a few like it's obviously insanely powerful there's just not a ton of ways to do this we don't have like a snapcaster major or whatever so we do have stuff like finale of promise mission briefing those are kind of insane like can you imagine casting a finale of promise after geist of regretting an instant sorcery in your graveyard and then you're going to get to cast each of those twice that is kind of absurd also great with mechanics is just naturally let you cast instants and sorceries from the graveyard things like escape things like flashback like cast on barrier rights get two for the price of one seems pretty great uh, i think maybe one of the most hilarious things to do with it is increasing vengeance at historic uh, increasing vengeance if you cast it from your graveyard for five mana you get to copy an instant or a sorcery you control twice well if you got geist of regret that itself is going to be copied so for five mana you can get four copies of any instant or sorcery you control from a more spike keeper perspective probably the strongest thing to do with geist is play it with leer uh, leer just lets you cast all your stuff from your graveyard geist or regret fills your graveyard for leer and then as you cast stuff with leer you're able to double up all those spells as it win more probably but what's wrong with winning more once in a while underworld breach also seems pretty good another way that you can just repeatedly cast a ton of stuff from your graveyard doubling that up seems pretty good as well the only downside is outside of like the leer control decks i don't know where you play this card like it's a spirit but it doesn't seem like the kind of card spirit tribal would want i don't think they have enough spells to really make it worth it or the ways to cast the spells from the graveyard so i think geist of regret definitely powerful could be a good synergy piece support card for something like leer control there's definitely combo potential tutoring things into your graveyard flashing them back like once you start going off with this card it is going to be really good but it is five mana it doesn't really do anything other than fill your graveyard a bit right away you're gonna need to find one of those rare ways to recast cards or build around it with something like escape or flashback so powerful although I'm not sure the best way to harness its power in a format like alchemy or historic we also got discover the formula six mana instant seek three non-land cards into your hand and then cards in your hand perpetually gain this spell costs one last to cast so this is essentially a six mana draw three with a bit of a weird twist it compares to like graven lore precognitive perception the twist is because you're seeking non-land cards you know you're not going to be drawing lands which is probably probably a good thing like in the early game you often want your card draw spells to hit lands once you get to six mana you probably don't need more lands so you're probably happy actually to not have to worry about <laughs> drawing lands with like graven lore you're probably scrying lands out of the way discover the formula just make sure that you don't draw lands at all you're gonna get three non-land cards at instant speed and then even though discover the formula a little bit expensive compared to other draw three options it kind of makes up for this by giving all the spells in your hand negative one mana to cast so it's 
more upfront, but in the long run, it's going to be even cheaper because you're going to have at least three cards in your hand and hopefully more. And then those spells are each going to get a one mana discount. So this is also kind of like a weird ramp spell in a way. It also gets around Narset because Seeking technically isn't drawing cards, even though the effect is the same. I could see this being a decent control card. I don't think you're going to play four of them, but I can imagine like Lear in Alchemy playing it. Maybe the Teferi decks in Historic playing a copy of it. The other place that it could be really good is in ramp style decks. Maybe uh, like a Bant ramp style deck, a Simic ramp style deck, where you're just playing your gross spirals, you're into the Norse, trying to ramp into this. And you cast this, hopefully you're onto some Ugans or Crossuses or Ulamogs and get the discount. So it's kind of a card draw spell that is also a ramp spell, which seems absolutely perfect for some sort of ramp style deck. So discover the formula, a little bit expensive at six mana, but again, it's going to help make up for that with its cost reduction and drawing three cards or seeking, I guess, three cards, never a bad thing. We also got a little blue two drop in Clone Crafter. So Clone Crafter, three mana, one, two. When it enters the battlefield, conjure a duplicate of a random creature card from your opponent's library into your hand. It perpetually gains you can spend mana as though it was mana of any color to cast this. So this is essentially an Elvish Visionary or a Flibble Fip. But instead of drawing a random card from your deck, you are going to get a random creature, a duplicate of a random creature from your opponent's deck. This could be good or bad. I can imagine you're playing some sort of aggro tempo style deck with this, and then you hit a seven mana coma, not going to be super helpful. Or maybe, you know, it's in the late game and you hit a one mana Usher the Fallen against Mono White. That's also not that exciting. Also, it's only a one, two, so its stats aren't really good, but this card just seems amazingly fun. What I want to do with it is a Gonti Panharmonicon. Imagine playing Gonti and playing Hostage Shaker and playing Panharmonicon and then Clone Crafter, essentially just stealing your opponent's entire deck and copying your opponent's to tell your deck and beating them down with it. So Clone Crafter, I think this is more of a fun card than a super competitive card, just because it's going to be super swingy. And I don't know, you put cards in your deck because they synergize with your deck and you want to draw and play those cards. You don't know that your opponent's deck is actually going to synergize with your deck. So there is a risk there that their cards don't work well with your cards, but there's nothing more fun than like, getting copies of your opponent's cards, beating them with it. The randomness of this card is going to be hilarious. It's going to be super fun. So I I kind of love this card. I think this card is like medium power level, but S tier as far as how much fun it's going to be to resolve and what's going to happen once you resolve it, no one knows. It could be any creature in your opponent's deck, which is absolutely awesome. We also got a new counter spell, Kindred Denial, four mana instant, counter target spell, CK card with the same mana value as that spell. So Kindred Denial, it's essentially a twist on Dismiss, four mana counter spell, draw a card. Kindred Denial doing the same thing, except you're going to be seeking the card with the mana value of the spell that you countered. This could be good or bad. Uh, on one hand, it makes sure you're not going to draw into a random land unless you're, you're not going to seek into a random land unless you're countering a zero drop, like an Ornithopter for some reason. On the other hand, there is whiff potential. Like, let's say you counter a, uh, I don't know, an eight drop, like Ugin, and you don't have any eight mana plays in your deck, well, then you don't get to seek out anything, because seek does require you to have a card that meets its criteria in your deck. So I think that Kindred Denial, probably like a good historic brawl card. I imagine that's where it shows up the most. If four mana, maybe it could see a little bit of alchemy play, but really, it's about a mana too much for your typical counter spell, even with the draw card upside thrown in. I think it still might just not quite get there. We also got Obsessive Collector, a four mana, four, three spirit with flying in ward two. And when it deals combat damage to a player, seek a card with mana value equal to the number of cards in your hand. So uh, very similar to the last card, actually. It reminds me a little bit of Shadow Mage, Infiltrator, Strunggeist, Emrith, these creatures that are evasive. And when you hit your opponent, you draw a card. The twist with Obsessive Collector, of course, is you're not drawing a card. You're seeking a card with mana value you equal to the number of cards in your hand, which kind of is the same problem as the counter spell we were just talking about. A lot of times it's going to be great. You're going to have five cards in hand, get a five drop out of your deck. going to have four cards in hand, get a four drop. You're not drawing a random land. You're not drawing a random one drop you don't want. You're not drawing your finisher that you can't cast yet. So there is upside there. At the same time, there's also going to be times when maybe your deck only has a couple five drops and you hit your opponent and you got five cards in hand and you're not going to draw anything at all. So you're going to have to do some uh, gymnastics to try to make sure the number of cards in your hand 
And when you hit your opponent with this is the number that you want to seek out. It also kind of opens up some combo potential. Like if you only play one four drop in your deck and can manipulate your hands, you only have four cards, you know what you're going to seek out. <laughs> you're going to be getting whatever that one four drop is. So there is ways you can build your deck to kind of control the randomness. And this is something we're going to have to get used to. This is something I've learned from playing a bit of Hearthstone is when you have all these really random effects built into your deck, they're going to be random, whether you like it or not. So your job is going to be to build your deck into playing a way where you can minimize or even embrace that variance and hopefully be able to turn it to your advantage. Uh, so Obsessive Collector, my big concern is I don't know how easy it's going to be to snowball a four mana, four, three flyer. Like for this to do work, you got to keep getting in combat damage. And we got Loth with Reaching Spiders. We got Elite Spellbinder that trades up with it. We got Ren and Seven, huge tokens. We got Goldspan Dragons. So there's a lot of flyers. There's a lot of removal. Ward 2 is something, but it's not an Immerith or something. It's not a huge ward that's going to be impossible to kill. It's more of an annoyance. Like, uh, your Infernal Grasp is 4 now instead of 2 or whatever. So it's not unkillable by any stretch. At the same time, we've seen decks build around snowballing effects like this be very strong. Like the Curious Obsession decks, which are actually built around spirits now in Historic. This kind of is a Curious Obsession build in. You hit your opponent, you draw a card. 4 mana is not a bad rate for a 4-3 flyer with a bit of protection that's going to be seeking through your deck as you hit your opponent. Could even be the top end in a spirit deck we were talking about. You know, being a 4-3, maybe you can't get in enough to get through the elite spellbinders. Well, if you got a patrician, guys, or a supreme phantom type effect to pump it, then it's going to be even easier to keep hitting and hitting and hitting. And you just have, like, rattle chains to protect it. So Obsessive Collector... Definitely interesting. On one level, we've seen this card a lot of times before. A creature hits your opponent, draws a card. Relatively powerful effect, but this definitely has a new 2021 digital era of arena twist where you're seeking out the card, which can be a benefit, can be a drawback, and definitely gives you something to think about as far as how to manipulate the number of cards in your hand to have the best odds of hitting the card you want with that seek ability. So potentially a spirit card, potentially just a good standalone threat, but definitely very interesting. And that oh, brings us to the end of our daily alchemy spoilers for today. So let me know what you think about all these ridiculous new cards. What do you think about the format? Are you warming up to it at all? Still not a fan. What cards are you hyped about? Are you going to play it? Are you going to play them in historic? Let me know what you think in the comments. Thanks for watching. I hope you all enjoyed it. And I will be back, I think Monday, with more daily alchemy spoilers. So until then, everyone, have a spectacular evening, a great weekend, and I will talk to you soon. Thanks for watching the video. If you enjoyed it, help us out by clicking that like button down below. And to keep up on all the latest and greatest, click that subscribe button. And don't forget to hit that bell icon to get alerts whenever we have new videos. And if you want to, check out some of our other sweet videos here and here.